Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At the moment, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those that are connected by telephone and require operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. For those online that require assistance, please use your chat box on your screen. I would like to now hand the meeting over to your host, Maria Judd, Vice President at the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Please go ahead. Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is part of the Canadian Northern and Remote Health Network Virtual Learning Exchange Series. I'm Maria Judd and I'm a Vice President with the newly amalgamated organizations of the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, CFHI, and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, CPSI. And I also have the privilege, uh, privilege excuse me, of co-chairing the Canadian Northern and Remote Network uh, with my co-chair, Greg Cummings, from the Authority of Health Services. So on behalf of the network and our amalgamated organizations and our guests today, I'd just like to welcome you and thank you for joining us um, during this very busy time for everyone. And before we begin, I want to recognize that we are gathering from a variety of places across the country, many people working from home or in unusual remote locations. And I also want to recognize that the main offices of our newly amalgamated organization, CFHI and CPSI, are located on the traditional and unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe and Territory Six peoples. And certainly one of the things I've been learning is that a traditional land acknowledgement is an act of reconciliation that involves making a statement recognizing the traditional territory of Indigenous people who have called the land home long before settlers arrived. So at this time, I'd like to invite each of you to introduce yourself using the chat feature where you're joining us from across the country, and if you're comfortable to share and to reflect on the land and territory that you're joining from. So please feel free, that chat feature should be available to everyone. I'm also joined behind the scenes by our CFHI staff from our Northern Indigenous Health Team, Desina Abelopoulos, Megan McKinnon, Megan Sabian, who will be operating our chat behind the team and ensure we have an opportunity to be exchanging ideas and questions. I also want to thank our producers, Sheena Powell, Kelly Ripley, and Megan, uh, so excuse me, Michaela Lab. A huge thank you also to those who have helped plan and deliver today's session, our virtual learning exchange working group, for participating in making today possible. Shannon Dunfield from Alberta Health Services, Charlene Lastrin-Miguer from Manitoba, Wendy McLean from Alberta Health Services, Michelle Stinson from the, our patient partners, and Lauren White from the Government of Yukon Department of Health and Social Services. I'd like to let you know, because sometimes it's hard when we're in a virtual forum, who else is around in our virtual room, that we have quite a diverse group of individuals participating in today's session from coast to coast, with the majority of participants who registered joining us from British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and Newfoundland. And thank you for bringing a diversity of perspectives as you come from different parts of the health system and wear different hats and roles as administrators, consultants, nurses, researchers, policy advisors, QI specialists, providers, and patient partners. I want to let you know that we're really pleased to offer this webinar bilingually. So if you'd like to hear today's presentation in French, please dial into the phone number on your screen. And we invite you to use either official language when you're sharing questions or comments throughout today's session in the chat box. You should see both the English and French, French slides on your screen throughout today's event. If you're having difficulty seeing the information, you can choose to maximize either the French or the English by clicking on the button that looks like the four diagonal arrows just above the slide deck. And lastly, a reminder that today's session will be recorded and made available on our website in the coming days. I'm also very pleased to be joined by my co-host today, Kelly Brownbill, who's an Indigenous educator, facilitator, and consultant, who's certainly been a support to me and guide on my reconciliation learning journey, and will lead us through some reflections today and discussion from her own experiences with cultural safety and Indigenous partnership. Kelly, thank you so much for collaborating and planning and, and making today possible, and I'd like just to hand over to you for a moment so you can introduce yourself. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Maria. Rowena Bojo, Wabananga Kikwe Indigenous Cost, Wabja Shido Dem, Migba Anishnabe Kwe and Dao, Dom Gukdonjaba, Apading the Day Kwe and Dao. 
Thank you so much to everyone who's um, joined us here today. I'm so excited uh, to hear um, from everyone and all the perspectives on such an important subject, um, incorporating cultural safety into service provision. Um, I come to you today from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, specifically uh, the Three Fires Confederacy, and I am very privileged to live and work and play on this territory and know that that privilege is based on the unwilling and forced sacrifices of those who walked this earth originally. And I uh, do promise to do everything I can with my agency to make sure that we don't repeat the sins of the past and rather leave a better future for those who come after us. And certainly, um, leaving a better place for those who come after us is dependent upon understanding what cultural safety looks like in frontline service provision, uh, specifically in our new virtual reality. So thank you so much for inviting me here. Looking forward to hearing um, our speakers today and to starting some conversation amongst all participants. Ahau chimigwech. Thanks so much, Kelly. And we're also really delighted to be joined by our guest speakers today from First Nations Health Authority in British Columbia, Fiona McLeod, who's the Clinical Project Manager with Primary Care in the eHealth team, and Aaron Tesco, the Clinical Director for Primary Care Development in eHealth. And I'd like to ask them to introduce themselves as well. Over to you first, Erin. Um, good, I'm going to put my camera on. This is a very, there we go. Hi. Good morning, Hello. everyone. My name. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes, perfect. My name is Erin Tedesco. I'm the clinical project director for eHealth and primary care development for the First Nations Health Authority. I am a registered nurse by trade, and I am presenting to you all from the unceded traditional territory of the Sinaiq First Nation on Vancouver Island. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much, Erin, and over to you, Fiona. Hi everyone, just doing a quick sound test as well. Can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, hi everyone, Fiona McLeod, Clinical Project Manager with the First Nations Health Authority Primary Care and eHealth team. It's a pleasure to be here with you today and I am joining you uh, today from the traditional unceded and ancestral territory of the Seals Nation. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. Thanks so much both. So we'll move forward to really you know, we're, we're, we're the journey to today and our focus and the opportunity for conversation and shared learning today. Um, so this uh, webinar, this virtual learning opportunity really came out of a discussion that we had in May actually among members of the Canadian Northern Remote Health Network, which really um, include health system leaders who are part of systems or north of 60 and across our three territories, who had came together in May with a really shared interest on understanding um, the opportunities, innovations, and promising practices around primary uh, virtual care. And of course, that was just in the time we were early, much earlier on in the pandemic. And there was a strong, strong interest expressed by members for continuing uh, the journey of shared learning and opening up the circle and inviting others in as we really sought to understand how do we improve virtual primary care in the time of pandemic and beyond in northern remote contexts. So really excited uh, to be here today with all of you for that learning and discussion. And our overarching objective over the next three sessions, the first one being today, is really to provide an opportunity for a wide range of stakeholders to connect um, who have that interest in virtual primary care and to provide opportunities for learning and sharing of innovations. So today is the first of three uh, topics which we're going to bring the lens of virtual primary care uh, in northern and remote contexts to our discussions and exchanges. Today's focus on cultural safety and Indigenous partnerships. Um, in the new year, in January 29th, we'll be looking at a deeper dive on enhancing equity and access. And then later in March, uh, patient and family-centered care. So today's objective is we'd like to create the space to learn more about cultural safety and Indigenous partnerships in virtual primary care, including the consideration and sharing of what may be needed to support culturally appropriate care. And secondly, to hear about and share from all of you opportunities and challenges that have emerged with virtual primary care, and to give some consideration to how we can sustain and grow culturally safe virtual care. So first we'll hear from Fiona and Erin, who join us today to tell us the story, um, their story of bringing virtual primary care services to community at the First Nations Health Authority, 
and they'll dive into learnings and some of their process as it relates to engaging and partnering to co-design and deliver services to meet local priorities and keeping grounded in cultural safety. And then we'll turn to Kelly, who will walk us through some guided reflections and some questions and offer some um, of her experiences and insights. And then we'll also have the opportunity to open up uh, the discussion using the chat feature. We will ask you to share your questions, your comments, your experiences and reflections in the chat box. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Fiona and Erin, and I believe that Erin, you're going to start us off. Thanks. I'm actually going to go off camera only because my camera's at the bottom of my laptop, so to switch slides, you just see my fat fingers moving, and that becomes very distracting, I think, to everybody involved. <laughs> Absolutely. We look forward to hearing you. <laughs> For those of you who may or may not know, I often find uh, when we speak, we make the fundamental assumption that everybody understands what First Nations Health Authority is, and so we're just going to do a brief introduction of how we got to where we are today. Um, so the First Nations Health Authority assumed all of its program services and responsibilities previously handled by Health Canada's First Nation um, and Inuit Health Branch in the Pacific region in 2013. It was a very arduous journey over roughly a decade of 203 First Nations chiefs coming together and agreeing unanimously that they wanted to repatriate health services into the province and under their own control and direction. The FNHA's vision is to transform the health and well-being of all BC First Nations and Aboriginal people by dramatically changing health care for the better. We're responsible for the planning, the management, service delivery, and funding of health programs on and off reserve for our urban and away from home populations in partnerships with First Nations communities in the province, guided by the vision of embedding cultural safety and humility into the health service delivery. Um, we work very closely to reform the way in which health care is delivered to BC First Nations throughout the province by means of direct service delivery, provincial partnership collaboration, and health systems innovation, which is mostly what we're here to talk to you about today. The vision of FNHA is to have healthy, self-determining, and vibrant BC First Nations children, families, and communities. First Nations in BC have a rich history of wellness that extends back in time for many thousands of years. Uh, prior to colonization, they enjoyed good health and wellness due to a lifestyle that was active, based on healthy traditional diet, and enriched the ceremonial spiritual, emotional, and healing practices. We're working to reinstill that back into the larger system so that it's honored not only in community, but also with our health partners. The first initial work for us um, was around the telehealth expansion project, and part of this came out of a larger set of documents um, and the tripartite framework that was designed in partnership with the federal government, the provincial government, and the newly minted First Nations Health Authority. And in that tripartite framework, there was an action item number 23 that called to action uh, the development of a robust and expansive telehealth system across all First Nations communities in the province of British Columbia to try and mitigate some of the geographical constraints faced by communities, as well as to address other issues, such as social determinants of health, that may prohibit and create barriers in families and communities being able to access wellness services and health services in a meaningful and um, efficient manner. Through this, we developed and continue to use a very, very intense process of engagement. So at the initiation of the project, which is now switched to operations, because um, the project closed in 2015, we work very strongly side by side with community. In the initial project, invitations went out to all 203 communities to take part, um, to gauge interest, and to look at how we could best expand telehealth across the province in a way that was meaningful for community. A lot of work, and I've been very blessed in my work to have visited a large majority of the communities we service, um, was around actually putting boots on the ground, going into community, understanding their needs, what was their readiness, 
Um, what was their technological capacity? What were their clinical capacity? Did they have service delivery coming in? What did that look like? Were those relationships strong? Were those relationships fractured? Were they intermittent? What was working and what wasn't? And then really the bulk of my work and Fiona's work is around developing clinical workflows with communities. So identifying what communities perceived gaps in access to care are. Um, Fiona and I both being healthcare workers, nurses by trade, both having worked in community and in the larger health system, um, know that as providers we often jump to the solution because that's what we've always done. Um, this work is really about assessing what is it that community needs to better partake and be engaged in their wellness journey. And then moving from that, we develop the workflows, we look at their readiness, um, and we work to map and match alongside with them providers or services or programs that could be implemented in community and supported through technology on an ongoing basis. Part of that process also involves the deployment and training and, of course, ongoing follow-up. So what we don't do is we don't typically, as a rule, run into community, drop off a bunch of equipment, and then leave. We work very closely with all of the communities because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's their program to own, run, and manage, and we support them in developing a program that makes best sense for them. <clears throat> so what you're looking at in this picture is actually a live video shot of a, of a patient's eardrum. Um, off of one of our telehealth carts. Uh, we have been successful in enabling 95 of the 203 communities. There's obviously constraints um, from an infrastructure perspective and other constraints at play that haven't allowed us to lift all 203. And of course, now we're living in a COVID world, and so that's changed landscapes quite dramatically. Um, We've been very successful in transforming the way in which care is received in community and the way in which care is engaged with at the community level and also from the larger system. So prior to the FNHA telehealth expansion project, virtual care in the primary health care space was really hit and miss. There were some people doing it, the majority were not. Um, and so it really created a space for us to develop and work with community and our larger health system partners in shining a light on just how important and foundational primary care actually is, and also in allowing communities to really train the providers they were working with and educate them in what it meant to be culturally safe and culturally humble and wanting to be educated in tradition and ceremony. Um, and so I think we've been very pivotal in the provincial stage in truly transforming what primary care looks like from an innovative lens in First Nations landscapes. Well, we've certainly created access on a broad scale. Um, Fiona will speak later in this presentation to our two um, newly created pathways that are virtual that include primary care as well as psychiatry and substance use services. But in the initial outset, um, of the work we were doing. It was really about creating access. And access was defined by community. And it wasn't necessarily primary care facing, although that was typically the number one identified gap in access to care. But it was other things, educational opportunities, um, linking youth um, and young moms to completing high school but not being able to leave community to do that because somebody had to look after the kids. And so we have worked in partnership with community to create access to a broad spectrum of services and program delivery. Um, some are training healthcare workers virtually. So their you know, personal care aides and their LPNs are fundamentally training in community through video conferencing and only leaving to write their exams and then, of course, coming back and providing service to community. So really creating that grow your own um, human resource base and creating larger capacity in community to take on more roles. Um, it also provides access to, to families, so simple things like visits. When you, when you can't leave community to visit your granny or your sister who may be in a larger city center receiving care, we've created systems in our pathways where patients are linked to their families through video conferencing means. And now I'm going to turn it over to Fiona to talk about our two new programs. Thanks, Erin. 
So I'm going to focus us in for a moment here on what has been an incredibly challenging year. The dual public health emergencies of the COVID-19 pandemic and the overdose crisis have deeply impacted BC Indigenous people and communities. Early on in the pandemic, healthcare operations and support services in a number of First Nations communities were reduced or closed. While most have since reopened, many are still working under temporary restricted access processes, and I, I imagine that's probably pretty similar across the country. This year, we've also seen a devastating increase in the rate of overdoses and overdose deaths in BC. And both the overdose and overdose death rate have had disproportionate representation in the First Nations population. So in urgent response, First Nations Health Authority developed and launched two new virtual services, the First Nations Virtual Doctor of the Day and the First Nations Virtual Substance Use and Psychiatry Service. Both these services are available to all status and non-status First Nations people and their family members living in BC. Métis and Inuit people are also absolutely welcome to access the service. The intent for both services is not to replace where successful pathways already exist, but rather to provide a pathway for First Nations people and their families who've been challenged by accessing appropriate services, whether that be barriers related to local closures, transportation and distance, geography, provider availability, or barriers related to cultural safety. So looking a little bit more at the slide here, uh, on the left, launched April 1st, the First Nations Virtual Doctor of the Day is a primary care service that provides access to family practice physicians. People can self-refer into the service, and provider appointments can take place either by phone or by video. There's three main purposes to the First Nations Virtual Doctor of the Day. The first is to improve access, timeliness, and quality of culturally safe, integrated primary, care, primary health care services, both virtually and closer to home. The second is to develop primary health care that is designed, led, and delivered by and with First Nations. And the third is to improve and establish key partnerships that promote innovation and transformation of health and wellness services with First Nations. Looking over to the right, our First Nations Virtual Substance Use and Psychiatry Service was launched on August 17th. To access this service, people can get a referral from any health and wellness provider that they're connected with. So that might be a family practice physician or a nurse practitioner, but it might also be the community health nurse or the wellness worker or a traditional medicine specialist, or maybe it's a referral through the virtual doctor of the day service. Appointments can take place by phone or by, by Zoom or by video, and subsequent care planning and support happens in close partnership with the client's local circle of care, and the entire service has been built around this principle. The First Nations Virtual Substance Use and Psychiatry Service has three main purposes. Uh, the first is to provide virtual access to addiction specialists and psychiatric care for First Nations people and their family members living in BC. The second is to provide addictions medicine and psychiatry services where every client encounter is aligned with the principles and practices of cultural safety and humility. And the third is to provide addictions medicine and psychiatry services where collaborative care planning and wraparound care services are integral to all client encounters. And you can find, if you're interested uh, in getting more information about either of these two programs, we have a lot of information up um, on our public website, fnha.ca. Under the What We Do tab, you can find virtual services there. So I'm going to pass it back over to, to Aaron from here. Thanks, guys. We tried to keep the slide deck small. Uh, I find when I'm in presentations that it often gets confusing to have to read and listen, and my brain doesn't multitask quite that way. So we're actually moving into the last slide, because um, I find m most people have more questions about the work they, that we do versus me just sitting and, and talking at you. Um, so you know, we're going to close it with, with some successes, and, and I think we've had many. I'm exceptionally proud of the team I work with, and I'm exceptionally proud of the work that we have managed to um, bring out. And by hook or by crook, I think COVID was um, part of that success and that it allowed us to move quite quickly, um, and it dropped many previously existing barriers around issues of privacy and platforms and um, other 
ministry mandate suddenly went out the door. Um, and so we've been able to slide in and, and create some really unique um, programs and, and processes for communities who otherwise wouldn't have um, access to service. I think our largest success really in the work that we do is in having been able to create a space where community now has the option to not only take part um, in the care that is being delivered in their community and or um, away from home, but they have choice. There's a real sense of being able to choose with whom they work and in what manner they engage and how they um, reflect back to the larger healthcare system, the unique community settings needs and priorities that exist in the First Nations landscape. Um, fundamentally, everything that we do is driven by community and the nations that we serve. And I think, you know, what we always have to remember and what guides everything that I do is that ultimately community, just like the rest of us as patients in the healthcare system, know best what services we and they require and the providers that they most want to work and engage with on the long-term journey to wellness. And we thank you for your time. Or as we would say, Coast Salish Paichka. Huge thanks to both Erin and Fiona. And I'm just going to pause for a moment and invite folks to reflect on what Erin and Fiona have shared. And if you have any questions that you'd like uh, as Erin said, to, to ask and to ask for additional information or reflections, I invite you to enter those into our chat uh, feature. And then in a few moments, I'm going to hand over to, to Kelly um, for her to share with us as well. We um, already have one question in the chat box. Um, someone has said they're very impressed by the model and wondered if they could share the template on their readiness or needs assessment. Um, maybe you can talk about that a little bit, please. Um, you'd like to know more, uh, like, what the assessment looks like or how we engage with the assessment? The question is not specific, but I think both of those topics are of interest. <laughs> So the assessments are quite unique and reflective of each community and of course for those of you who don't know the British Columbia landscape, we have five regional health authorities. Uh, there's the island, there's Vancouver Coastal, Fraser, um, Interior, and North. Um, and then there's our Provincial Health Services Authority, which deals with sort of the higher level specialty quaternary care of, of cancer, women's health, etc. FNHA mirrors those five health authorities uh, from a regional landscape, and so each of the readiness and needs assessments are based A, on the region that we find ourselves in, B, the sub-region of the larger region that we find ourselves in, and then, of course, in the community. And so it's looking at things like um, how many people are living in community, uh, what's the ultimate ebb and flow, because what we do know is that many First Nations communities and their members are quite um, transitional and often moving from, from different places um, in many different ways, and so ensuring that we capture that, so making, um, you know, sometimes in certain communities numbers increase over winter for hunting purposes, they increase in summer for, for fishing, et cetera, and so really capturing that, looking at are they servicing other communities that may be um, First Nations based and non-First Nations communities. And so recognizing the rurality and remoteness of some of our communities and the giant geography that is British Columbia, um, we know that there are a lot of nursing stations that are actually taking on work of non-First Nations communities because they are the closest health center in, in the catchment. Um, and so looking at those, those mechanisms of numbers, um, what services are currently on the ground, what services aren't, how do we bridge those, um, and how do we create a model that makes most sense given all of those constraints that A, builds capacity in community, but is also sustainable for community from a housing perspective. I mean, if we invite 30 new providers into community, where are they staying in the event that they can't get out? 
and do they have the capacity to manage that and what does that look like? Um, do they want providers in there for that length of time? Where are the relationships strong with the regional health authorities? Where could they use some work? So it's a little bit of understanding where community is coming from and then acting as an advocate in the larger system on behalf of community to try and get those health services in or to start from scratch and just build a brand new model, blow it all up, and um, go from the beginning. So it's very context dependent. Thanks so much, Erin. Maybe if your technology is working, we could invite you to turn your camera back on so we could see you as well sure. as hear you and, and sharing some of your experiences and responding to questions that are coming. There you are, thanks, uh, that are coming through the chat. Uh, and just looking, so uh, there's another question that's come through. Uh, it says, thanks for sharing your work. Can you speak more to whether you work with communities to identify indicators of success and evaluate your efforts to improve access and responsiveness of programs to community needs? So questions around that approach and um, what evaluation and, and what better looks like. So yes and no. When we were in project mode, we did go through a very extensive evaluation process. Um, and much of that was around the fact that the initial project was funded by Canada Health Infoway. Um, and so there were definite reporting parameters that we had to meet in order to honor the agreements we had made with them. Um, in working with community, it's always a slippery slope, the evaluation context. Um, we're a very numbers-driven system, and when you look at the BC landscape, I think our largest community in the province is Cowichan Tribes at 5,000 strong. There's other communities that have less than 30 people. And so if we only see one virtual care visit occurring out of that community of 30, can we honestly say that we haven't made a difference? No. We can't. If we have a community of 30 that's hitting up virtual care every minute of every day, maybe we have a larger problem that we have to look at. And so really a lot of our evaluation work is around gathering the stories and gathering what those interventions look like and hearing back from community what the value they placed on those engagements really truly was. Um, with Doctor of the Day and the VSEPS program, we do, again, have a very extensive evaluation framework, but it is a two-pronged approach. And so it relies on feedback from the patients engaging with the pathways. It also relies on information and feedback from the providers working in the pathways and also looking at the larger system and how it's been responding and interacting with our pathways. Um, there are obviously more stringent numbers around that. As a call system, we're able to track that a lot better. Um, and it works differently than what's happening in community. And, and certainly, because of the way in which we've modeled based on community needs, um, you know, the health system may not be so concerned as to whether or not nine RCAs were graduated out of a, out of a program. Um, and so it's, it's really now about shifting the lens of what we're using virtual care to do and how we're defining it in this province. And, and that's also a very large conversation at the table because we do use it differently. Yeah, th thanks so much for those reflections around both taking that big picture and looking at multiple perspectives and understanding what numbers tell you and, and what they don't. So thanks so much. Um, lots of great questions coming in. I'm going to turn over now, though, to Kelly uh, to continue our sharing journey. Um, so she's going to share with us a little bit more about her experience with cultural safety and Indigenous partnerships. So over to you, Kelly. Uh, no, I don't want to. I want to continue this conversation because there's such great questions and such amazing work being done um, with the FNHA. Um, my work is all in supporting um, frontline service providers and um, people that are working in healthcare that don't have access to um, a, a 
central First Nation run body like FNHA. Um, and there was a poll at the beginning of our time together that asked about how do the people in your community access care? Is it through a First Nations or Indigenous organization? Is it through mainstream um, service providers? Or is it a combination of both? And I think I didn't look at it towards the very end, so I don't have the final numbers. But it looked to me like there was a significant number of you whose community members are accessing care through mainstream service providers, the same as anyone else. You're going to the hospital, seeing doctors, um, through, through whatever is available in the closest town to you or through whatever uh, virtual um, services are available to you. And that provides an extra level of challenge when we're thinking about cultural safety and cultural um, competency. Because we're asking service providers, quite frankly, to do a very difficult job. It's easy in the work that I do to say, you need to listen to me and you need to learn to do this. And it's easy for communities to say, um, if you're not culturally competent, we don't want you working in our community. But we also have to recognize how incredibly difficult that is. Um, in the work that I do, I find I need to start um, dismantling wrong assumptions and wrong understandings of the history of colonization in Canada. Our education system has been woefully lacking. And so it's not just a matter of building on um, knowledge and understanding that they have, but rather dismantling the colonial perspectives they've been taught and challenging them to relook at everything they believe to be true, that you know explorers were heroes, and to really look at what happened and how that affected uh, the way that we interact with people from outside of our communities today. So we're asking them to forget about all they they might have known, to relearn, and they're bright people, they can do that. But then as soon as we get them to understand an Indigenous perspective is different, that um, uh, indicators of health can be different for First Nations people and in our First Nations communities, and we get them working with one community and they think they're doing great, and then we say to them, well, you know, the Indigenous population is incredibly diverse. It's off reserve, it's on reserve, it's so many different nations, it's so many different histories, and we're trying to get them to understand how how they can interact individually when they're already reeling um, from the larger pictures. So we're, I think it's important um, that we recognize we're asking a lot of our practitioners to become culturally competent and to create culturally safe spaces. And we need to do what we can to support them. Um, I believe that we need to provide them with a really firm foundation on what they need to understand. So looking at, for example, colonization through a specifically indigenous lens before we start talking to them about the vast inequities in healthcare um, and health realities within our communities. If we start talking to them about um, you know, how disproportionate we are, uh, it was opened up, I think Erin said at the beginning, she was talking about an increase in the um, overdoses and overdose deaths and vastly disproportionate for Indigenous people in her province. Before we get them to understand that or we just tell them that, we need them to know why we got there. That uh, it, um, it's the accumulated trauma that left the existing situations within our communities that are causing those difficulties. And I think most people that are working with Indigenous communities today truly understand trauma-informed care and we don't have to go there. But they need to understand where that comes from for them to appreciate um, the realities within our community, the realities within our communities both on reserve and off reserve. And so once We've accomplished that. We need to teach them how to listen because the diversity is so complex that they really need to listen and not to re-traumatize. Um, we, it's very easy to talk about traditional modalities, and those of us who pay attention to um, things like returning to um, traditional ways in order to help people heal from trauma, we get very caught up in that, but we forget that not everyone is interested in those streams of, of healthcare. They're not interested in looking at um, traditional uh, homeopathic remedies. They're not interested in looking at ceremony as part of their healing. And we get healthcare providers all excited about expanding their concept of healthcare to include these things. And then they offend someone who they ask if they want to speak to a traditional healer or a traditional medicine person because they've been raised to believe that's worthless information and they want a CAT scan and they want a prescription and they don't want anything to do with that and we leave again our practitioners 
quite off balance at understanding that. So we need to treat our, everyone that's working on the front line in any kind of service provision within that heading of healthcare on how to listen and address Indigenous concerns. So for example, just as one example of how we teach them to listen, I often encourage um, frontline service providers not to ask direct questions concerning identity. It's a very Canadian um, process when you say, how should I respond to you? Should I call you Mr. or Mrs.? Would you prefer I called you by your first name? It's a very Canadian thing for us to ask someone how they would like to access their services. When you ask directly to an Indigenous person something that specific to identity, do you prefer the term Indigenous? Do you want to self-identify um, as Indigenous, as Métis, as Indian, as Inuit? When we ask those questions, we are approaching what can be very dangerous territory because it's identity that was targeted through those processes of colonization and assimilation. And we're left with those sense of identities quite fractured. I worked for a long time, 10 years, um, in the largest single-site employer of Indigenous people in the country. And I was trying to support over 800 Indigenous um, staff members incorporate into a very rigid corporate structure with 3,000 other non-Indigenous employees. And that was something that was very hard for uh, my non-Indigenous employees to understand, that you can't just go up and ask one of their Indigenous colleagues, how come you don't like the word Indian? The colleague might not know. They might be very com comfortable with the word Indian. They might be embarrassed that they're more, not more educated about the nuances of their own culture and their own histories. Any time we look at the specifics of identity, we risk re-traumatizing the person that we are asking. So that's one example where we start to teach practitioners to listen rather than to ask. Um, when we're working with people in social work and in counseling, I tell them to open a door and see who walks through. So if you're looking at talking about incorporating traditional practices, you might talk about um, another client that really um, enjoyed being part of ceremony and working ceremony into their, um, into their health care plan and just see how they react as opposed to saying, would you like to do that, and putting them on the spot and risking reigniting trauma that comes from being taught that anything to do with traditional ways was evil and you were going to go to hell if you did that. So that's what I mean by needing to um, teach our practitioners truly how to listen, to incorporate the understanding of diversity within our um, structures, and to be able to move within the system guided by what they hear from community and from patients, and to base their, their interactions at that level. I think I'm going to stop there because I really want to get back to the questions. Um, is it okay, Maria, if I throw out the next question in the queue? Um, and feel free to ask any questions of me as well, um, if that was not specific enough. But here's the first question. Uh, virtual health has been identified as an area that Indigenous communities in northern Alberta could greatly benefit from. In part, this is because it's challenging to recruit local health professionals to remote areas. You mentioned a growth. Um, in your own program, that's to um, Aaron, I'm assuming, um, used in conjunction with virtual health. I'm just wondering if you can expand on that. I'm, I'm not clear on the question of growth, so I'll go with how I'm assuming this is meant to be perceived. Um, virtual care was the starting point in many cases for communities. Um, where there was no care um, and or it was the responsibility of community members to come out of community and seek care in you know their local health service delivery mechanism. Um, that being said, what we've noticed, uh, particularly in our two current virtual pathways, um, just due to sheer size and volume of patients being seen, is that we now have created a space where we are taking on residents. And so I have five psychiatry residents who will be graduating in June who actively came forth wanting to have um, more experience in working with community um, and Indigenous populations who have been working quite closely with our medical director, Terry Aldred, um, as well as 
you know, obviously our communities and, and the patients that they're serving. And I'm very proud to announce that all five of them would like to work with us um, on a consistent basis. Now, for all of us who work in healthcare, we know how hard it is to find a psychiatrist. They're like a needle in a haystack. So for me to have seven currently working for us and five new ones wanting to join, um, it's amazing. We have psychology residents wanting to also um, start working with the pathway. And so there, there seems to be, from the provider end, a really keen interest in wanting to work um, with our communities and our urban away from home populations in a manner that is meaningful to the patients themselves, not necessarily that Western medical model. Yes, I, I recognize Kelly, and I'd, I'd really rather just listen to you than myself all day if that's possible. Um, really sort of striking that balance of, of how we provide care that is relevant to the patient. And so we've had, um, where there's previously been issues of human resource recruitment and retention, because the work is so gratifying and rewarding in so many ways, um, we have a lot of individuals coming out of school who are wanting that opportunity. And thankfully, I have enough seasoned veterans, if you will, who are on hand to be able to properly support and mentor um, these individuals as they sort of start their career. Did that answer the question for Northern Alberta? Yes, okay. <laughs> Thanks so much. There's a number of questions I think for you to hopefully respond to, Kelly, really some interesting reflections and appreciating um, your guidance about listening and not asking, but also seeking for some guidance on, on how to understand identity and, and to, how to invite that. So. Um, some reflections about, you know, what's in our traditional forms that we ask people to um, complete regarding race and background. Um, maybe you could speak to, to that and provide some ideas and guidance. That would be great. Absolutely. And it, it's a tough subject that I, I'm still learning about. I think it's still um, being formed as Indigenous people take control over how they interact with systems outside of their communities. We're still learning, so we're early on in this process. Um, and we, we need to ask people to self-identify if they're comfortable to do that, not just because we want to tailor the services to their specific needs, but we need the data. We need to understand how many Indigenous people are accessing what services in order to be able to respond more quickly and more aptly to their needs. So um, I think that it's important that we train the gatekeepers, the ones that are doing the intake, whether it's uh, the clerk sitting in the emergency room, whether it's the person that does the intake for virtual care, that they're trained to understand how to ask that question and what to do if they're challenged and who to ask that question to. Um, I prefer to ask if you wish to self-identify so that if people don't feel comfortable, don't feel safe in identifying themselves as Indigenous, however they define that, that they don't have to deny it. They can just say, I don't choose to identify at this time. So do you wish to identify as? And you need to pick something. I mean, we have to pick a word like Indigenous, or you could say First Nations, Métis, Inuit, but some people um, may not respond to those particular labels. You have to start somewhere, and you can talk with your the area that you work in, what would be most appropriate, um, because it differs by region. Um, and then if someone says, I don't like that word, I prefer the word native or I prefer the word aboriginal, um, you can respond to that and say thank you very much for letting me know that. But you want to make sure that they feel safe in asking, do you wish to self-identify? You also, if, um, you know, um, Aaron um, and Fiona are working with First Nations communities. It's not as much of an issue for them, but mainstream service providers aren't able to identify necessarily, and the people that are the gateways to the entrance into that care prov provision don't know even who to ask that to. They make assumptions based on physical appearance about who they should ask and who they won't ask. Sometimes they've asked and been challenged and said, why are you asking me? I'm not an Indian. 
and we still have those attitudes out there. And so because they've been challenged, they're, they're really afraid to keep asking the questions. So we need to support that process. So we give them a safe place to ask. We do the best we can to train them to listen to the responses that they get and to react to them and to have responses when they are challenged. Why are you asking me? Why do I have to tell you that? And they can comfortably deal with that um, in order for us to create those safe spaces in order to gather that data and to make sure we're targeting um, the proper services for the proper people. Miigwech. Shall we go to a question for the other group now, Maria, since I have the mic, as it were? Um, go for it. There's been a question. As the COVID context highlights the role of social determinants of health, your reference to cultural safety factors seem important. To what extent have both participants and providers been able to integrate these SDOH in the framework? So that's for you, Erin and, and Fiona. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely can. So the preamble is, as the COVID context highlights the role of the social determinants of health, the reference that you made to cultural safety factors seem important. So the question is, to what extent have both participants and providers been able to integrate these social determinants of health into your framework? Erin, I can speak to one piece of that um, through, through the Substance Use and Psychiatry Service, and then yeah, you can probably go through that expand. First. Yeah, you can, then you can expand further on that after. Um, so one of the really big pieces to launching the Substance Use and Psychiatry Service for us was ensuring that entry into the program was as low barrier as possible but at the same time making sure that anybody accessing this service had a support in their local area because each day we have one psychiatrist and one addictions medicine specialist serving the entire province. So we might have a physician who is uh, on Vancouver Island um, providing care to somebody who is in a northern, a remote region in the north. So having somebody on, on the other end sort of in the local area supporting that client wherever they're at um, has been a really important part of sort of starting to address social determinants of health. And one of the really important um, pieces of our substance use and psychiatry system is that um, for at least the, the first appointment with a psychiatrist or an addictions medicine specialist, we actually encourage whichever provider that that person is connected with, whoever they feel that they trust. Um, and, and can support them actually comes to that appointment um, with, with the client. Um, so that sort of helps us to stretch across all, um, you know, all, all different social determinants of health to make sure that there's, there's somebody with that client who can, um, you, you know, sort of who understands where they're at, um, understands uh, potentially some of the resources that they can pull in in their area depending on what that client current situation is um, and, and to be able to provide that um, that additional support to the client. And I'll, um, uh, so that's sort of one example in one of our services and I'll hand it over to Erin for a second to see if she's got anything else that she wants to add sort of on a broader, on a broader level. Thanks, Fiona. I, I guess I, I stumbled on the COVID shed light on social determinants of health. I, I don't know that COVID shed light per se, as those have been persistent existences in, in many of our communities. Um, and I would say the vast majority across the nation, Not this is not solely um, a British Columbia based issue. Um, I think in addressing and trying to embed within some of our framework and, and our model um, you know, we've done work with our urban and away from home population, particularly in the downtown east side, where we know that there are barriers to access to technology um, and, you know, by, by way of a phone. And I don't know how many pay phones still exist in the larger Canadian landscape, but I certainly haven't seen one in a good long time. And so we did work with some of our not-for-profit partners 
um, and provided cell phones with business cards stating both pathways on them um, and prepaid minutes to try and alleviate some of the burden so that access became um, more readily available versus having to rely on, on a walk-in clinic or um, an emergency room. There's been extensive work at the organizational level um, around trying to find appropriate housing for those who do end up COVID positive and have to leave community um, simply because they cannot safely self-isolate due to sheer numbers in, in their homes. Um, that's sort of, I think, where I can leave that with any sense of truth in my statements at this point in time. And I'm not sure that it answered the question. If I could just pop in for just a quick second, um, there's always been challenges with culturally safe and culturally appropriate care. I think in some ways COVID has exacerbated that. We talked about that at the Spotlight series that CFHI hosted um, when we talked about the additional challenges that might be faced by Indigenous people um, come, you know, that are embedded within that process of trauma recovery because of our collective history. And the situations that arose with COVID may have exacerbated some of those things. So I think the examples that I gave at the time were um, simply queuing up and be, having to line up outside of a, a grocery store in order to be allowed in so there's the proper number of people in the store at a given time to do your shopping can be extra traumatizing for someone who comes from a residential school or a day school where all of their time was regimented and, and those lineups were, um, those queues are a real reminder of that time when they had no control over their life. Um, Masks. Um, we know the horror stories of what they did to little children when they spoke their language and how that involved um, sometimes putting things over their mouths or doing things to their mouths. Walking around with a mask on can be extra traumatizing. So it, it doesn't, I love the expression, I don't know who first coined it, we're not all in the same boat, but we are in the same storm. So we need, again, our um, practitioners to understand that we're all in the same storm. We're all affected by COVID, but some of our boats look a little differently, and they need to be able to dial into those differences to make sure that they're providing culturally safe care. Miigwech. Thanks, all, and thank you, Kelly. Some good, good chat, people sharing and responding into questions in the chat feature, and can, I encourage you to continue to do that as well. Um, and uh, thanks, Aaron, for the response to the question about wondering if you've included broader um, specialists and services within uh, your programs and that physiotherapists uh, are, and are part of it and occupational therapists. And if others um, have other programs to share that have, are including broader services, please chat that in and share um, as well. Maybe there, we could go to, there was a couple of questions regarding interpretation. Um, and one of the questions was, are interpreters uh, involved when delivering care, um, or do you find they're needed? And if you do find they're needed, do you have a process for identifying training and hiring interpreters? So for us, no. <clears throat> it hasn't become a necessity um, or an ask. The, the first ask we've gotten around sort of interpretation has been involved has involved a hearing impaired um, patient. So the platform that our physicians use on both pathways um, is Zoom, and it obviously has a chat box function. There are probably slicker um, closed caption based programs, like I know Google has a platform. Um, we are constrained in how we utilize technology. There are privacy um, laws and legislation in place that guide and dictate uh, what we push forth um, in the healthcare setting, and so we have to be conscientious of that. I know that there is work at the Provincial Health Services Authority level on bringing in virtual interpreters um, in the context of the wider BC setting, but from a First Nations lens, we haven't had the need to do that at this point in time. Um. This has been an issue for quite a while, the understanding of um, interpreters. And um, I found in the regions that I've worked that most fluent language speakers still prefer to have medical information shared to them in English because the language is it's, it's not always a straight translation. Mino Yawin Health Centre in Sioux Lookout in Ontario created three different lexicons specifically meant to bridge that gap to be able um, to offer a, a 
a concise and um, constant way of uh, translating things like dialysis. How do you find a word like dialysis? So they created uh, lexicons in both Ojibwe Cree and OG Cree. So that's been an ongoing problem, and um, it depends, I think, very specifically on the region and your uh, the needs of your specific community members. Again, that's why it's so tough on practitioners, because we're not all the same, and we do not have the same um, Thanks so much. We, ha we had a couple of reflection discussion questions we wanted to, uh, to share. Maybe we can move to those now and invite um, those who have joined us by chat and, of course, Fiona, Aaron, and Kelly um, as well um, to respond. So the first question um, we wanted to ask uh, to everyone is you know, thoughts and sharing about how we start the journey of building trust with elders, community, and or indiv other individuals who may be skeptical of virtual care to improve the continuum of comfort with these technologies. So reflections, experiences, Fiona, Aaron, Kelly, you can share, and also inviting those to share via the chat as well. I, I can answer that, I guess. Um, <clears throat> Like I said earlier in my presentation, I've had the um, very distinct privilege of spending a lot of time in a large majority of the communities in our province. Um, I like to talk. I'm naturally, well, I don't like to speak publicly, um, but I'm naturally a friendly person and I like to learn about people. And so for me, working in community is, is my Zen space. When there is a storm, that is the port I run to as fast as I possibly can. Um, and it's just about sitting with and, and being present and, you know, sharing stories. Um, ironically, we've had this question asked many, many times. My elders are never my issue in technological <laughs> update. <laughs> they love it. Um, it's one less trip out of community. Um, I'll share a story of, of an elder in, in a community known as um, Tache, and, and she gets dressed up every day for doctor day. She puts perfume on, and, and I asked, I said, you look lovely and you smell divine, but for what? Well, it's doctor day. But he's on the TV, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and lines up simply just to see the face. Um, uh, trust is, is always an interesting thing, and I think it's just about being able to build the relationship. When there's trust, you don't have to worry about whether or not the technological uptake will occur. If they trust in you and what you're attempting to achieve in partnership with them, be it the individual and or the community, the rest just follows organically. That's been my experience to date. Thanks, Erin. Anything you'd like to add, Fiona? Coming off mute, I think. <laughs> I forgot I was on mute. Thanks. Yeah, I, I would just um, echo what what Aaron said. Just really taking the time to 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 spend with community, build those relationships, and you know any opportunity that you can take to build those relationships in person in the community is is huge. Being able to be there in the space um, creates you know so much more of a mutual understanding, um, and and really serves a lot to, to build that trust. And we can't always do that, especially right now um, in, in, the, in the current space. Um, but just really, if, if the only way that you can connect is, is virtually. I really, really liked what, um, what Kelly said um, earlier in terms of um, opening a door and seeing who walks in. And you know, that's so often what we, what we do in our conversations. You know, go in um, to, to a virtual space, maybe without an agenda or without a very firm agenda and just sort of see where the conversation goes and whatever is important to somebody will, will come up in that conversation and you can be curious and explore that and take in trust and that, that goes so far in, in building trust with elders and with, with community. Thanks Fiona. Kelly, anything you'd like to add or share in addition? Um, we've known in our communities 
since the beginning of time that we are relational. Um, it's how we've always been, and we're starting to learn how to do that with um, mainstream service providers and, and with practitioners. And, and so what Aaron and Fiona have said so eloquently is that we need to make time to build those relationships. So it's not about building trust, it's about building the relationship. We learned that very clearly um, with the work that CFHI did with the Promoting Life Together Collaborative, that we had to invest the time to have a two-hour teleconference where no agenda item got ticked off except that the elders introduced one, one another to each other. So you need to build in the time to be relational, and the trust comes from there. So to me, I wouldn't even ask, how do we build trust? I would start to build relationships, and the trust will follow. Miigwech. Thanks very much, and I think that that also relates to our theme of today about how to create time and space and opportunities to build relationships, even in a virtual um, in an environment when there may not be the opportunity to be literally um, face to face. And I know from speaking with others across the country too, many have shared that when there has been a positive um, experience of virtual care in a community, then that person sharing that story of this is what it looked like and this is, and it was positive with others has been very powerful um, as well. And that's about the relationships within community and, and the sharing of experiences as well, I think. Thanks for those who are, are typing, typing in and sharing uh, their experiences and also some resources. Thanks uh, to Kathleen for sharing a translation tool. Uh, Donna from AHS is sharing going into community to hear and listen using telehealth with cameras. Relationships are key, so definitely echoing some of what's been shared. Okay. Maybe we can move to uh, the next question that's been pulled up for reflection and discussion. And I think connected, but uh, let's pose it and see if there are additional reflections or sharing people would like to add. Um, so the question is, what are some of the best practices for practitioners when working with Indigenous partners and community to provide culturally safe and trauma-informed care? Kelly, maybe I could ask you to start this time. Certainly. So there's, I don't know if I have best practices per se, but I certainly have um, some key learnings over my um, 25 years of having these conversations with practitioners. One of them is the need for continuing education. Cultural safety, cultural competency is not a check mark on a list someplace. You need to continually invest time in understanding the broader um, national issues. Then you need to spend time with the communities and the individuals within your care because we are so different, we are so diverse. So I would say um, that would be one. I would also say the key to um, committing to develop relationship, which we just talked about, is absolutely key as a best practice. And to be able um, to listen, to be able to adapt. Um, I often say in my training that 30 years ago, service provision was a round hole. And if you were a square peg, you were out of luck because we only provided services in one specific way. Everybody got an hour with the specialist. Everybody got four sessions, and then they were kicked loose. And so many people didn't fit into that round hole. But 30 years ago, the best you could expect was for somebody to help you shave off your corner so you'd fit. We know better now. We know that it's the person asking for help, the person seeking services, whose perspective needs to drive this bus. So we need to encourage our practitioners to listen to the needs of their, um, of their clients and their patients and to be able to adapt to those needs, to be able to let go of how they think service provision should look and adapt to what the person actually asking for the help thinks the service provision should look like. Miigwech. Thanks so much, Kelly. Anything you'd like to add, Erin? Well, I think Kelly summed it up, really. Um, but fundamentally, it, it comes back to the listening. And, and I think everybody sort of dropping some level of expectation at the door. Uh, I am not the expert, although I am the expert in certain things. I am not the expert in all things. Um, and obviously, if a patient is choosing to interact with me and I'm, I'm putting my ex-nurse cap on, um, then, you know, I have some advice and guidance, hopefully, to provide. But, you know, so long as 
we're both in a space of willingness to learn about one another and what we can offer each other and again build that relationship um, you know that's really all that that I can echo and add is it's it's again it's that relational piece and taking the time to understand and I think the healthcare system under the current constraints that it's often facing doesn't afford itself the time and, and we do Fiona and I get asked that a lot um, you know how have you been successful why have you been successful because we take the time and yeah I've spent a lot of COVID has been brilliant for me because I've been home for nine months which is probably the longest I've been home <laughs> since I started this role seven years ago um, but it is it's, it's the boots on the ground and and meeting the people and shaking the hands and kissing the babies as I like to say um, to understand what are you working with it's all fine and well to say I understand we're all remote but until you get on that seaplane that drops you in the middle of the ocean you have to wait for the chief to come and get you with the boat to take you up the river and then you have to walk three miles across the sand to get to the health center and oh you didn't bring gum boots that's most unfortunate um, you really truly can't say you know what's going on and so I think for Fiona and, and myself and the rest of the team that we work with the success has been in physically being present and taking that time to understand and learn and grow from that. Thanks Erin. Just going to invite you if you wanted to add any reflections Fiona. Yeah thanks. This is a great conversation. I don't know how much more I can possibly add to it but um, I, I will say that First Nations Health Authority, we have, we have seven directives um, that we ground all of the work that we do in. Um, and those are, those are also available on our website. But the, the one that really speaks to me is, is the very first one, and that's community-driven, nation-based. And I find that that one is, is particularly helpful to constantly ground myself in as a, a, as a practitioner and making sure that whatever I'm doing or whatever interaction I'm having, am I still approaching this in a community-driven, nation-based um, way, uh, making sure that, you know, this isn't my agenda that I'm trying to push on anybody. Is this coming from community? Is this coming from nation? Um, I, I think, too, that it's really important for practitioners to, to be gentle with themselves. Um, if you are approaching things with curiosity, if you want to learn, you know, and, and you have an interaction that doesn't, that doesn't go well, Reflect on that. Um, talk to your colleagues about that. You know, how can you, how could you approach, how could you have approached it differently? And, um, you know, make make a promise with yourself that you'll try something a little bit different next time. But be be gentle with yourself when when you're working through that. Um, and then the one last thing, I'm just echoing um, what Kelly and Erin have so eloquently said about relationships. You know, for for me as a nurse. Um, one of the things I like to say is don't ever let anybody tell you that going and having a cup of tea with an elder while you're on work time is not part of your nursing job. That is absolutely part of your nursing job and that is very much relationship building that will absolutely, you know, lead to what somebody might identify as more traditional nursing work. But having that cup of tea and sitting there and having a conversation about, you know, how somebody's granddaughter is doing today in school is absolutely part of your work as a healthcare practitioner. Thanks so much. And for those who I can see nodding heads as you're, as you're sharing that reflection, Fiona, so thanks for that. Um, I just had reposted something someone had posted earlier to make sure uh, folks saw that it's helpful around some guidance and resources for folks who may find that technology or Zoom is new. So there's some um, resources there as well uh, on topic. At this point in time, I'm going to invite folks to continue to share in the chat, um, but I'm going to move us towards um, our wrap-up time and uh, say a huge, huge thanks to Aaron and Fiona and Kelly for joining us today and all of you. I know it's a really busy, unusual, and challenging time, so appreciate everyone sharing your time with us today and sharing your questions and reflections and resources um, in the chat. And I uh, just wanted to say a specific thanks, too, to the organizing team, um, to Spina, Megan, Megan, Mahila, and Rebecca, and our network members um, and invited guests. And uh, any final remarks? I'll come back to you in a moment, uh, Kelly, uh, Aaron, and Fiona. Um, but we do hope people found today's session and discussion helpful. Um, we have a couple sessions coming up as part of this virtual learning exchange, looking at prime, virtual primary care in northern and remote contexts. So that's January 29th 
um, a deeper dive into equity and access in virtual primary care, and then March 5th, um, looking at patient family-centered care in a virtual environment and a focus on safe transitions and safe virtual care and some of the new challenges and also opportunities uh, that are arising in that space. Registrations for these sessions are available on our website, and we've also included them in the chat box. Um, we also have some other virtual learning exchange opportunities if they're of interest to you and or team members uh, as part of our session um, around sharing some early promising practices that emerged really from part from phase one of COVID in long-term care homes. We have six promising practices and policies that are on our website in national huddles and chat opportunities monthly to connect and talk to others in long-term care sectors around real-life challenges and what's happening in long-term care, how people are resp responding to pandemic preparedness, um, person-centered care, how do we welcome, reintegrate family members as essential care partners, not visitors, and really concrete policy guidance and implementation supports and opportunities to connect. We invite you to uh, check that out if that's of interest as well. That's LTC Plus on our website. Um, and we'll also be hosting with Dr. Alexina Greenhill, founder and CEO of Care Team Technologies, uh, next Monday, November 30th, um, an opportunity to look at how artificial intelligence is being used and maybe could or should be used in healthcare, and you can register on our website for that as well. So lots of opportunities to connect virtually if there are some topics that are timely for you. Um, we want to hear from you how we did on today's session. Your feedback really does shape what we, what we do next and how we do it. So uh, we just have four questions for you as part of our evaluation. Please take a moment to give us your feedback before signing off uh, today. And just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone and members of our, our network, uh, our planning team for our virtual learning series, our guests today, Erin and Fiona and Kelly and all the folks behind the scenes. So thank you, everyone. Be safe, uh, be well, and hopeful. And uh, we look forward to connecting. Please share your feedback with us on the evaluation questions and or the chat before we go. So this concludes today's event. And just a reminder that our session has been recorded and will, may be, will be made available via the events page on our website. Uh, we'll also be emailing that link to all participants who signed up for today's session. And of course, you're welcome to reach out to CSHI or CPSI staff to connect with anyone here today or with other questions or suggestions for things that we could help share. And we're happy to be a platform for uh, providing those virtual learning exchange opportunities. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, take care. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. You may now disconnect.